Welcome, Guy, to the Tucson Blockchain channel. Uh, for everybody that's watching this, uh, Guy is what you would call a Bitcoin OG. Uh, he's been in it for a <laughs> long time. And he has this awesome podcast called uh, uh, Bitcoin, let's see, the Bitcoin Audible podcast. And it's um, this fantastic podcast where he goes and reads different essays um, of interesting people uh, to, talking about money and Bitcoin, um, which is perfect for me because I, I hate reading, but I love audio. Um, so if you're like me, you'll like that. Uh, but yeah, uh, welcome, guy. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. So brought you here because I like your work. Um, so start off, uh, what, what would you say money is? So money is, it's a communications tool, right? Um, it's the ability to like, because I like exchange money for, for something that I had a value, it allows me to have a comparative way to, um, to weigh the value of uh, something I then want. And money is essentially just this, uh, this independent medium we use to take measure of that, like a as a metric. But kind of the basis of uh, uh, something with any economic value, like to measure economic value, it has to have the economic value in and of itself. Um, like, like we can't just, because value is something that's subjective and subjective in the sense that it's different for everybody. Like, like I might value a car very, very highly, whereas somebody else's situation, they don't really need a car and they can just Uber or taxi everywhere. You know, it's like, it's totally dependent on our situations, our values, what we want to accomplish, all sorts of things. Um, so because of that, the, the ability to have that, uh, independent medium it has to be able to have a price and a value in and of itself in the market to relate to everything else so it's kind of like that totem um that it's it's the one thing that has a market that's so great in an economy that everybody can just relate to it rather than having to relate to all of the things so like rather than me having to figure out how much my shoe is worth in comparison to your car I can compare my shoe to the largest asset in the economy, which is money. And then you can compare your car to money. It's that, it's that middle ground between all other activity in the economy. Um, but in a sense, it's just an accounting mechanism. It's just a way to keep up with points. Like it's, it's kind of like the ruler um, for measuring value. Um, and uh, because of that, it becomes the most, like it kind of necessitates, it's the most important thing in an economy to keep things flowing, to keep communication accurate between what I think is valuable and what you think is valuable. If somebody starts screwing with our measurement, you know, if, if we have an elastic measuring tape, then I have no idea how to compare my shoe to your, like, or your house to my house or anything like that. Like the measurements are different for us and the ability to actually have a productive economy starts to fall apart. Um, so it's really, it's critically important that money is actually a, a stable thing um, in uh, like, like a stable measurement tool. And I don't mean that in price either. I mean that in a uh, 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 metric, but that's, that's a little bit down the rabbit hole. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think that's a really good explanation. Um, uh, ben and Colin from the WTF happened in 1971 turned me on to an article by Nick Zabo called Shelling Out. And Oh, good one. Yeah. Yeah. And I was reading that um, this week. And it, money has been something that's been consistent throughout human history because we need it. So like you were talking about the making uh, transactions efficient because without that means of exchange, um, we would be bartering across the board. And so you yeah. said, uh, um, and it, it, one thing that was interesting in that article was it talked about kind of the, and it seems like every time that money fails, it is because somebody starts manipulating it. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what do you think makes a good, uh, good, what makes good money? 
Um, well, uh, just I'm not sure if you if you knew because um, it's really, really deep in the episode list, but um, I do have shelling out in audio for anybody who wants to listen to it. Um, but uh, uh, and it's God, it's a, it's a really good one. Um, but as far as what makes a good money is essentially unmanipulable. Uh, the because it becomes that totem in the economy for everybody to weigh their value against. It also necessarily becomes the most corruptible thing. Like if you if it's one half of every transaction, the power to manipulate or modify money at will without cost, because the key is that like to execute a trade to to actually get a hold of some money, you have to voluntarily exchange value with somebody else. And it's based on their their weight. Like, you know, like you can't you can't come and be like, you have to take these shoes at $50. Like it's whether or not I accept them. It's like, well, uh, $50 is a lot. Like I'm kind of a $20 shoe kind of guy. And like, I'll just step away. It's the exchange. It's both of us that determine whether or not that value is, is correct. So the, um, the ability to manipulate money and to make money without having to make that trade off without having to compare it to anything that I've done in the past, you know, to have a tree that, you know, grows dollar bills or whatever is the power to consume the whole world and never give anything back. The idea of the economy of a voluntary exchange uh, economy is that I have to give value for value, period. That's the only way we could possibly get along and actually scale society is that you do a thing and I do a thing. And we have this this uh, kind of intersubjective tool to um, so that even though you are the one who potentially put this favor or this product or this service into the economy, well, you don't have to redeem it only from me. You can redeem it from the economy at whole. And the money is just the tally system that says, these are the people who have been producing and making things for society. Um, these are the people who have done given more value into the system than they have taken out. So like, just think about it in the context of like your job or your position, whatever the hell it is. Like I used to be an internet technician. So if I had saved a hundred thousand dollars worth of like savings while I was being an internet technician, that means that I have fixed a hundred thousand dollars worth of other people's internet. And I'm not done any, I'm not taking anything back. I haven't taken any of the sandwiches that they made or the shoes that they, they put together or the cars that they built. I've saved it. I've just put all of that productivity and kept all of those machines talking and uh, kept the lines up and done all of these things without, without asking for anything in return. I've taken nothing from the economy. I've run a huge surplus. I've run a roughly a hundred thousand dollar surplus for the economy as a whole. And essentially the economy owes it back, you know, like I didn't do it for free. I did it based on um, uh, exchanging, being able to exchange it for what I need um, later on and to make my life better. Um, so a, a bad money is one where somebody can just fudge the numbers. Like somebody can just manipulate the balance sheet and be like, well, I have a million dollars, not because I put value into the economy, not because I did all of these other things and exchanged it freely with other people and that the economy actually owes me something because I've helped other people, but because I just say I have a million dollars. Like I just write it on a piece of paper and now I can consume a million dollars worth of other people's stuff and I don't have to give anything back. I'm just going to, I'm just going to give points and I'm basically going to destroy the value. I'm just going to confiscate the value of the measuring tool we are using to keep tally of this rather than actually providing anything into the economy. Um, that is a bad money, one that can be manipulated. Uh, and so a honest money is, is one that stays relatively and or as stable as possible in amount like a stock, you know, a stock for a company, like you issue, it's just a hundred percent. It's just a percent of ownership, right? So like if Apple issues a million stock for its company, it doesn't like a couple of years later, like issue another 2 million. Like if you own 20% of the uh, Apple company at the beginning of its, of its life, well, you still own 20% later on down the road. 
Um, and to issue another 2 million is just to cheat them out of their 20% without, you know, without permission, without their consent. And money works the same way. It's just the whole economy as opposed to just one single institution. It's, it's what you contributed to the thing as a whole. Um, and for the same reason, everybody would be absolutely furious if Apple just issued millions and millions more in stock. Um, we should rightfully be very, very pissed off that anybody is printing even $10 of new money. Sure. Yeah, one of the really interesting situations that uh, has happened in 2020 was uh, what happened with George Floyd, where he was uh, arrested and killed um, after trying to buy something with counterfeit money. Um, <laughs> yeah. And kind of the irony of that situation, uh, there were a lot of uh, memes I saw on Reddit and Twitter about that situation of the Fed getting to counterfeit uh, trillions or you know whoever else and uh him getting killed for 20 dollars kill, killing counterfeit counterfeiters yeah yeah <laughs> exactly um yeah uh why do you think there's such a big disconnect between uh uh the under normal people understanding that concept that money printing is bad for them um because it's it's removed um it, it's really abstract and it's also something that there's there's no real foundation for so when you're kind of told the exact opposite you know your whole life you just kind of like okay well that's how it is you know money is something that's inherently very very misunderstood um it's like water to a fish you know they don't like it just it just is um and you start to equate like bef without really digging into it because it's not something that you quote unquote have to learn or figure out or be introduced to. It's just something that always is from start to finish. Like you're born and money is there and it's basically the same money, you know, years later, you know, it's not been really new. Um, but yeah, I think the, I think the major issue is just that it's, there, there doesn't seem to be any reason to learn it. And when, uh, when the market for money is so vast that the government or the Federal Reserve, like, you know, whoever it is, can print hundreds of billions of dollars, can just issue it, and that the consequences are so unbelievably slow, um, it's just so hard to pinpoint cause and effect. You know, like, you, like, people just think that, like, the price of healthcare just goes up because, like, healthcare people are evil. Like, you know, like, it's like, well, no, it necessarily could not go up if money was stable. Like, if, if you couldn't print money, like, like, end of story. Like, the only way that the price of one thing could go up is if the price of all of these other things are falling to account for that. Um, the only reason, like, prices just don't go up naturally, but people just think that that's just how it is. Um, and uh, they don't. They don't take that next step to learn it. And it's not even taught. It's not taught in our schools, you know, because why would you, why would you explain to someone why you have, you're the only one that's allowed to have a tree that grows money um, when everybody else has to work their butts off for it. Yeah. I wouldn't tell anybody about it. I'd keep it secret. I'd, I'd be, a, it, it'd be hard. It'd be hard to give that up. Like that's a horribly corrupting power to just have the power to consume whatever you want. And while everybody else has to work day and night to get even a fraction of it. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the cancel on effect is a really good understanding um, or good explanation of this, uh, mm -hmm. this issue. Um, and yeah, I think there's a disconnect to kind of reflecting what you're saying because it, it takes time for the money to get uh, for the inflation to follow uh, the initial money printing and for yeah. people to, but yeah. Um, if it really is, if it's like truly realized, you know, over a two year period, like you don't notice, you know, and at the same time, businesses are actually, it's in their best interest to make it hard to notice. Like they don't want to be the first one to raise the price. 
And they, they also don't want to have to tell somebody that's like, oh yeah, the price is now 20 cent higher. So what they usually do is they release a new product that's actually just a little bit less net weight that's the same as the old product or they, they, they shorten it and make it longer like a candy bar or something like that. Or they, they change how the point system works on your Starbucks points. And like they, they just, they slightly modify things over a long span of time and they do everything they can to not make it seem like costs are going up um, for, for good reason. They don't want to, they don't want to anger their customers. It kind of puts them at odds. They kind of have to trick their customers to make it seem like they aren't screwing them over, which is what the customer's general position would be. If you're like, Oh, why, why are you, why is the coffee I got 75% or 75 cent more expensive than it was last year? So they're incentivized to do it slowly and sneakily and uh, uh, without being noticed. Sure. Yeah. And they're incentivized to uh, lower costs when it comes to paying employees and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. going the automated route from like a standpoint, you know, looking at Amazon, for example, um, they, <laughs> it would make sense to me from a business standpoint to want to just eliminate all employees instead of having them demanding more money, um, not working and setting up guillotines outside of your house. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so who are the counterfeiters? Who are the people printing all the money? Oh, there's a bunch of them. Um, like you kind of think about it like the central bank, but it's basically anybody who can run a deficit um, without needing to get a loan in a sense. Um, so uh, the government, every, every, every year the government runs a deficit. That's newly issued money. Uh, the Federal Reserve obviously prints money to you know, bail out institutions and to meet, to, to basically... Um, you know, uh, handle liquidity on the repo markets and to buy now just to straight buy up assets and treasury bonds and all of these things. So they're basically buying their own, uh, their own like government assets from, from themselves. They, they basically put the money in their bank account and buy it from themselves and then they owe it back. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, uh, and then obviously there's just the federal reserve system. Like the banking system is actually able to just issue new money as a debt, as a loan to somebody else. Like when you go to a loan, I actually have a, a friend that I've spoken with who's a CFO for a, a pretty large banking institution. And uh, we kind of talked about it at length one day, just kind of drinking, hanging out. And uh, uh, he, he really understands a lot of this stuff as well. I mean, it's so funny how many people in the banking institutions and the actual financial system couldn't explain this to you. You know, they just have a job. Like they, they, they do this one part of it. And they couldn't tell you, like you go to your average bank, not one person in that room can tell you what, how the fractional reserve system works and uh, where money is actually being created. Um, but he said, he's like, like, no, like, no, literally the money doesn't exist. We just issue it as a loan. Um, and now reserve requirements are basically zero because of COVID. Um, so even even a fractional reserve is not even is basically not even necessary anymore it's it's amazing but that's why you get the worst inflation in assets that are purchased with debt healthcare housing cars um education all of these things are massively debt based and you get 8% 10% inflation a year in these assets um and look, like look at rent like these are the things that are really um the most critical parts of having a good standard of living. Like these are the, the most important and the most valuable assets and they just skyrocket in cost every single year. Um, and, uh, and that's where it is. It's when you go into a bank and you get a loan when you get a mortgage for your house, it's new money. Um, and it's usually it, Technically, according to the fractional reserve banking system, it should have a fractional reserve. Like it should have like 10% actual money in the bank versus what they issue, but it doesn't turn out that way. Um, there's so many different regulations and special leveraging and uh, certain types of loans. And of course now 
COVID, the rules have been basically thrown out the window. Um, so all, all over the place, but mostly in the banking institutions and as debt. Yeah, it was pretty crazy uh, when I heard that the reserve requirements were cut to zero. That seemed <laughs> just that nuts. seemed pretty counterintuitive because you'd think the answer wouldn't be to further weaken the banking system. But yeah, it's like our problem is that we're way over leveraged, like eighteen to one for all of our obligations. So now we're just going to take the cap off the leverage altogether. <laughs> like that just uh, just ins it's like saying it's like okay well we've got thirty thousand dollars in credit card debt it costs us two thousand dollars a month in interest and our income is two thousand dollars let's just remove our credit card limit so you know that's not the that's not the solution to our problem guys but you know whatever i'll invest in bitcoin you you drag that shit into the dirt i don't, I don't really <laughs> care i guess <laughs> sure so yeah, getting into Bitcoin. Um, that's a good segue. Uh, why why can't Bitcoin be manipulated in the same way that uh, government fiat can? So any, like you could still do fractional reserve. And this is something that like so many people like argue with me about or whatever. It's like, oh, you could still just do this whole thing on top of Bitcoin. Doesn't matter if people have Bitcoin in the bank. It's like, no, that's not, that's not quite how it works. Um, the, the issue is that the dollar is, a dollar in debt is indistinguishable from a dollar that's a real dollar, right? Like if, if you got a dollar and it was actually one that was um, uh, actually had, it was backed by a dollar in a bank or whatever. And let's say the bank was doing 100, one to one, 100%. They only ever loaned out exactly what they had. Well, the bank down the street that's loaning 30 to one and uh, is just issuing all this money. Like when they get cash out of the bank, it doesn't look any different, but you can't tell that one of them is from a bank that's insolvent and one of them is from a bank that's one to one. Um, and uh, that's because th systemically, they are allowed to issue new currency. Now, a single institution could still do that with Bitcoin. There could be a bank that loans that, that, uh, that says, uh, oh, we have this many uh, Bitcoins of our customers and go 30 to one, like Mt. Gox. That's what they did. They did fractional reserve. Uh, and then, you know, you can have a whole nother uh, company that does it one to one and never loans out past what they actually have. But importantly, is as soon as somebody starts withdrawing, the one that's leveraged 30 to one goes out of business because you can still only, lo you can still only withdraw 1 30th of what they have. It's 100% based on the liability of the bank. Whereas in the dollar system, it's the entire system that's at risk because they can still, do, the, the dollars are already quote unquote withdrawn. You can go and put them in another bank and you don't even know or have any idea like, like the, the 30 to one could have been deposited into another bank and then loaned out again and put in somebody else's bank account and deposited and loaned out again. Like it could go on and on and on until you have 50 years of this stacking on top of each other and withdrawing it doesn't do anything. It's not, you're not verifying the supply because they're able to ma manipulate the underlying supply. Bitcoin can't, you can't do that. You can't withdraw fake Bitcoin to the Bitcoin network. Every single computer on the network is verifying down to the one 100 millionth of a coin exactly how many there are and that the rules have never been cheated. The only thing that can go out of business is Mt. Gox, which we saw. It lasted for what, four months? That was it? And that, was, that was fractional reserve banking on top of Bitcoin, four months. And then it implodes. So if that's the risk, okay, no big deal. We have, we've had it for 70 years and it's gotten worse and worse in the dollar system and it's potentially just gonna destroy the entire financial system, whereas Bitcoin was just one exchange. And that's the level of, you can't have systemic fractional reserve in Bitcoin. You can't make a fake Bitcoin because the very protocol, the very way that you define what a Bitcoin is doesn't allow it. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, 
And I think that's a big reason, you know, Mt. Gox is a big reason why so many people in Bitcoin uh, argue for self-custody instead of custody with somebody else because you can't yeah. trust them. And not it, your keys, not your coins. Yep. And for like the average person coming into the crypto or well, I would, the Bitcoin space um, and seeing that, I, I think they, they feel like it's a kind of a paranoid attitude, uh, but people will continue to keep on proving why it's, you know, a very fair um, concern <laughs> mm -hmm. for individuals. And that's, that's one of the cool things about Bitcoin too, is its ability, it allows you to self custody. You can't self custody dollars um, unless you have cash, uh, but digital, I mean, you're still you not, you're still not technically, it's not self custody if you don't know how much they are, you know, mm -hmm. like, like I could say, like, like I could say I could self custody, um, dollars because I have cash, but I'm not self custodying the value of them. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not able to confirm anything about what portion of that I actually have. So it's like, it's like I could, you know, like I might have, I'm, I might be able to lock somebody out of my room, but if somebody has got a master key to the whole castle, it doesn't matter. Like, like I've not, I don't have anything of uh, economic assurances as to what this is. Mm -hmm. um, I can hold my cash, but I can't say anything at all about how much cash there is out there, which mm -hmm. means I've not really got anything to speak of. Yeah, and that's really made apparent by these countries that have experienced hyperinflation, mm -hmm. 100%. Um, how, do, how can Bitcoin uh, help address extreme wealth inequality in our communities? Well, it's not really... Wealth inequality is something that I think is it's kind of blanket assumed as a bad thing. I don't think, I don't think quote unquote inequality uh, as a thing is something that we really need to solve quote unquote. Um, because what we want is to solve unfair inequality. We want to solve uh, corrupt inequality. But if like I uh, like go back to the internet technician example, Let's say I save 80% of uh, the value and services that I give as an internet technician for 60 years. And now I have $40 million worth of savings, um, which I don't even know how, how much you would possibly make in 60 years doing that. But let's just say $40 million. Like, that's not a problem. You know, like, like that the fact that I have more savings than other people that I'm wealthier is, is not a, that's not an inequality that we should be fixing. That's an inequality that we should support that, that should be applauded. Like somebody has been unbelievably frugal and just put massive amounts of value into the economy and not taken it out. And that's what it means to produce a lot of value. And that's what it means to have a profit. It means that, all things uh, equaled out at the end of the day, I put more into the economy that I took out. And based on the voluntary exchange of everybody I interacted with, they all agree. And that's a good thing. So if somebody is massively productive and somebody knows how to turn $10 into $100 by producing things and building fascinating new innovations and providing value for millions of people, it's important that they are the ones in charge of the money that we give them voluntarily. Like they should have the values that cause they can, they can produce 10 X what somebody else who would just, you know, buy, buy an LCD screen and sit around in their like living room. So as long as it's fair, as long as it's voluntary, inequality is fine. Inequality is great. We want those who succeed to be more rewarded than those who destroy value. But in the sense of our current environment, we have really sinister inequality. We have inequality based on how close they are to a political machine. And we have inequality based on who has the, 
the banking license to just issue money at will and basically make, I mean, think about, think about what it means. Like, let's say I've got zero dollars, right? And I get a banking license because I know somebody in politics and I got a good, I got a good powerful friend. Um, and now I just have the ability to issue money. Well, I issue a million dollar loan at 1% interest. Again, I don't have any money. I didn't produce anything for the economy. I, didn't, I haven't traded with anybody. I got nothing. But I can issue a million dollars and give it to you at a 1% loan. That seems like a great deal for you. 1% is dirt cheap. That means I get $10,000 a month from you. I have an asset. You have a liability. You owe me a million dollars for no reason at all. I just invented a million dollar asset for myself that's going to pay me $10,000 per month and I didn't do shit. That's evil. That is messed up. And that's what we need to solve. The people who are billionaires and have unbelievable amounts of money and have permanent positions in politics and are in the corporate like revolving door between regulator, politician, CEO, regulator, politician, like, like that whole system, that is a mechanism of corrupt inequality and it shouldn't exist. Those are just people who know how to fudge numbers and have a political authority to be wealthy rather than actually exchanging value with other people voluntarily and producing things for the economy. Yeah, that's, that, that's one of the best uh, explanations of the political monetary system and their relation I've heard. Uh, so yeah, um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, are you familiar with uh, Michael Moore at all? Sounds familiar, but I he, can't point. He does uh, some some documentaries. Uh, he's a very progressive. Uh, oh, oh, Michael guy. Moore. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. The one does does a sicko and, um, yeah, yeah. I know, I know Michael Moore. Yeah, yeah. He's a pretty interesting guy. Um, but uh, one one of the things uh, I, I was I forget which which documentary I was watching recently, but one of them, um, he was talking about how Americans are. Uh, you know, fairly progressive and, and have voted for change um, and not gotten it in the last however many elections. Um, mm. <laughs> and it's looking like in this election, there really isn't an option, a change option. Um, yeah. I mean, there hasn't been in the, in the previous ones, but at least they pretended there was. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, you, at uh, least you could like put up a facade and maybe convince yourself that there was something but now it's yeah. just it gets increasingly more and more embarrassing with every election mm -hmm. yeah so so what is the typical or what 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 are you doing to wrap your mind around what's happening right now in our country yeah politically? um so i kind of think it's it's the end game of a basically an imbalanced way of organizing society is that we're this is kind of uh, a new phase of moving into the digital world and the fact that we are organizing ourselves no longer through the political institutions and through the narratives that we're holding like communities and countries and things together um, and we are moving into an entirely new sphere. Like this is largely a consequence of the digital age, I think. Um, and this is just kind of the transition. You know, when the printing press came out, you know, for 50 to 100 years, uh, all political systems were in flux. Um, and you had, you had uh, rebellions, you had revolutions, you had civil wars, you had wars between countries like so many borders were changing because of the access to information because of the changing dynamic on how we told ourselves narratives about what sort of a community we were about 
what it meant to be a part of this or that. Uh, Knut von Holm talks about in his book, um, I think it's in the first one, uh, Sovereignty Through Mathematics, um, about how like we have these intersubjective narratives. And that's kind of what separates us from other animals that can only, you know, are only in like really small groups of like 20 or 30 or like, like, like uh, chimpanzees and that sort of thing, is that we have these vast intersubjective narratives about, oh, we're part of a corporation. And like, it doesn't really exist, right? It's just a bunch of people and a bunch of buildings, like sitting at tables and stuff like that. Like the corporation's not really there. It's just that everybody holds roughly the same idea of what it is and what they should be doing. And our polit political institutions are very much that same thing. And if you look 30 or 40 years back, there's basically one narrative. You know, you had three channels on the TV um, and there was a pretty cohesive narrative as to what we were, what the culture was, and it was dominant enough that if, if there was deterrence or if there was, a, if there was dissonance in that narrative or if there were uh, people who branched off, they didn't last, right? There was, this, there was this kind of cohesive center that we relied on and could uh, uh, basically push to the fringes anybody who differed with it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't organize those people. But now we live in this environment where I might believe some weird, crazy, bizarre thing, and I can actually find the eight other people in the world who believe that same weird, bizarre thing. And we can get in a chat room and we can talk about that shit. And we can share stuff and we can you know, look it up and we can explain it to each other and watch videos, like all this stuff. And because of that, communities that couldn't organize, that couldn't exist, that couldn't make a cohesive narrative about what they believe or what their values are, now can. And what we're seeing is that, that large cohesive political ideology splintering into a thousand different ones. And all these like crazy, like you get quote unquote conspiracy theorists that you know, may have a lot of truth and grains of truth and all sorts of different conspiracies. Um, but basically what we're watching is a breakdown of the trust in our legacy institutions. No matter what degree of truth there is in like a 9-11 conspiracy or the, the pedophile conspiracy and all of this stuff, the underlying uh, seed that sets all of these things in motion is that we kind of know that our political and corporate institutions now are so chock full of just lying assholes that all we know is that the, the old narrative just doesn't hold water anymore. And all those narratives are breaking apart. And that's what I think this is. Um, and it's gonna be a really rough transitional phase, but I, I think we're watching a shift in how we organize society. We're going to become networked communities. We're going to bifurcate or like, I think the idea of kind of holding together this big giant nation is going to be increasingly more and more difficult. Um, I actually think one of the best things that could happen is we break back up into 50 states. Um, I don't even think that that would be a bad thing. Like I think communities should be able to live the way they want to live and test out their cultures and their values and their ideologies. Um, and you should have the freedom to move. But yeah, I think it's a result of technology and I think we're going to see a lot of borders and a lot of things change in the next 20 to 30 years. I think Bitcoin is a massive fuel for that. You know, look at this one, one thing where you can actually exchange and hold value on a global scale. I don't have to care about what jurisdiction is. The capital controls and the jurisdiction around keeping my money within my nation is one of the most important, one of the most potent tools for creating the idea of a nation state. And that's being completely like dissolved away right now. Like there is a global, I don't really care what jurisdiction I am, I'm in, I hold 12 words in my head and it's the same no matter where the hell I am standing on planet earth. Means of storing massive amounts of value. That is not something to just scoff at. Like that's, that's unique in all of human history. So I think that's another major push towards the same uh, splintering of society that we're watching. Hmm.
Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, perspective, and it, <laughs> I'm feeling kind of afraid right now um, to some degree. <laughs> uh, which well, I, I, I wouldn't. I, I, yeah. I don't want to get. I don't want to be pessimistic about it um, sure. because, like, it's going to be a rough transition. But you know, the printing press was a rough transition. But what happened after is the Enlightenment. Like the, the, um, the explosion of value and cooperation, the ability to communicate and create new things and produce new things far outweighed the cost of having to make the transition into that new world. And I think the exact same thing is true today. I'm, I'm painfully optimistic, despite the fact that it's going to be messy to rip the bandaid off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you were talking about people not really understanding what money is because it's kind of like fish and water um, in a situation. The fish don't question what the water is. Um, and that's really one of the interesting things about Bitcoin, because when I try and explain it to somebody, the, the first question they they generally ask is like, what is it? Which is a huge question. You have to, <laughs> yeah. you, you have to go into like explaining what money is and, and, and why mm -hmm. the characteristics are different um, in, in Bitcoin than, uh, than other things. And uh, you know, what we've seen is the people that have adopted uh, new technologies like Bitcoin earlier have been people that have uh, benefited a lot more. And I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways from uh, what I'm, you know, this conversation that we've had so far is that um, the assumptions that we've made are about how society should work, um, how money should work, how uh, economy should be run, um, are not going to they're not going to, you know, things are changing so quickly and to, to be uh, building our perspectives on those assumptions, um, it, it will fail us. Whereas if we're willing to question and look to new ideas in um, such a pivotal point that we're in right now in human history, you know, we have a high chance of being successful. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, where Bitcoin comes in as, as money. Um, uh, and a safety net because, you know, one of the amazing things about Bitcoin is it, I, if, if the United States just kind of crumbled and went into a civil war and the money was worthless tomorrow, I would have the ability to leave the country with my wealth um, and go set up somewhere else. Um, I could go to Canada, I could go to Mexico, I could go to, you know, wherever. Um, Czech Republic looks kind of nice right now to me. Um, <laughs> whereas if I was just holding cash, uh, US dollars, I would be stuck here. Um, and yeah, that, that changes the narrative. Uh, yeah. Quite and a bit. whatever you had in savings, like let's say you had, you know, 10 years worth of savings from working your butt off. Um, and the currency collapses or they print $10 trillion to bail out all their corporate buddies and make sure the airlines still can fuel their jets. Um, and, uh, and you basically just have 10 years of your life deleted. Like all the value that you save because you saved it in dollars because you saved it in an asset that somebody could just create by the push of a button. You're, you just had your 10 years of your past just wiped out because somebody else said, I need it instead of you um, or my cronies need it instead of you. My subsidies need it instead of you and my political friends who are already who are lying and, you know, have private jets and all this, they need it. They need it. They, they need it to stay wealthy and you don't need it because you're a plebe. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, what, is, what do you think has been the most uh, exciting thing in, to happen in Bitcoin this year for you? This year? This year. Mm. Man, the micro strategy stuff got me crazy bullish. Um, I'm, I'm having Michael Saylor on the show. Uh, oh, no way. Uh, Friday. Or I'm, yeah, I'm going to interview him, uh, talk to him on fr uh, Friday. I hope, I hope I'm going to try to get the episode out on Friday too, but if not, it'll be Monday. Um, but uh, that, that whole thing 
was crazy bullish for me. And I think it's going to be a, uh, like a shift in mentality and how publicly traded companies look at this asset and how they assess like their treasury holdings and like whether or not they're in cash or treasury bonds or anything like that, because they're looking at negative real yields across the board. Like there's nothing really that they can hold in a, in a corporate treasury that could reliably give them any sort of positive return on hundreds of millions of dollars. <clears throat> and the fact that they basically made that assessment and an entire boardroom of people looked at all the different possibilities and they said, well, yep, it's basically Bitcoin. And then they invested $425 million. They bought 38,000 some odd Bitcoin and their stock price went up like 20%. <laughs> Like that's unbelievable. Like that's just a huge shift in um, like, like my, my thinking of like quote unquote phase five in Bitcoin was that we would get a lot of investment firms and pension funds and uh, all these things in treasuries for, you know, corporate, um, uh, corporate treasuries or whatever, looking at allocating a small bit, like, like it made sense for them to allocate 1%, 2%, 3% or whatever of their treasury to basically just have exposure to this asymmetric bet and to have someone go so hard, like just straight from, we don't have anything allocated to like, okay, yeah, let's just make it 90% of our portfolio um, is just so crazy bullish to me. Uh, the other thing would be the, the leaps that we have had in the lightning network. Um, I love strike. I use fold religiously. Um, I, uh, I used it this morning. Every, every damn near every day I am using lightning network to do something, send money back and forth, pay people for stuff, receive payments. Um, I've gotten a couple of people I work with, um, with the podcast and like the production company, we all use lightning. Um, it's, 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 it's amazing what you can do after you kind of get over that initial hurdle and strike really makes the initial setup because you're just using dollars. Um, I just got the onboarding is just a whole nother game. Um, and uh, that's super exciting too, because that, that's exactly that buffer that allow us to get to phase five while MicroStrategy is buying $400 million worth. And we still want to try to onboard users who could you know, use payment apps or like use these unique applications that you can only do um, with Bitcoin or uh, email newsletters with like little paywalls or like paying everybody a thousand sats to open up the email. I mean, like the number of possible potential applications that you could just tweak and use with this thing are just phenomenal. So um, both of those things have made me crazy, crazy bullish for 2020. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, got into Bitcoin in late 2017 early 2018 okay. yeah when mm -hmm. a lot of people uh got the in peak. and uh, yeah, yeah the, well i i got in right after um yeah but okay, uh, yeah nice I, well i started exploring during the peak I, I actually heard about it on npr i think i'd heard about bitcoin because you could like buy drugs on the internet or something um, <laughs> yeah and uh that was my first introduction then i heard about it being worth like eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars on npr one day when i was driving to work and and kind of became interested and, and then got in, followed it all the way down, um, uh, bought all through 2018 and just kind of bought up and down again. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just like the news that is coming out is just unbelievable. Um, it's, it's, it's looking more and more apparent that Bitcoin really will succeed and that, uh, I mean, other things that are, I think are bold. I, I agree. The micro strategy thing is just wild. I was listening to Pomp's podcast a little bit with uh, Michael Story. I didn't finish it yet, and that's pretty yeah. badass that you're getting him. I on. think I've got like 20 minutes. I think I've got like 20 minutes left in it too, if I'm not oh, okay. mistaken. It could be. Gotcha. It could be near the end of it. Yeah, that, that's really exciting. Um, and then the Fed too announcing today that they're going to have interest rates at near zero till 2023. I think. <laughs> I mean, it, the, it's like the, a freaking perfect storm, right? Yeah, it's everything is just working out. You just got to figure out how to get Bitcoin in the hands of uh, people in my community. Um, 
so that they're not completely wrecked as a result oh, of the. Man. I know. But yeah. Oh. So, guy, what's getting you through? Uh, what's giving you hope? Getting through. We talked a little bit about this, but what's getting you, giving you hope through this pandemic and and chaos that's going on right now? Oh, well, honestly, if it weren't for Bitcoin, I'd be really, really depressed. <laughs> like if if I couldn't see a way out of all of this crap, um, that you know, wasn't subject to approval in a sense. Um, it would be tough to see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, admittedly. Um, but also seeing kind of like the, like really kind of stepping back and looking at what the internet and um, more specifically, like the recent like eight or nine years of the mobile revolution of just making us 100% connected you know, you think the, the onboarding people to social media in the last like five or six years, there's a whole subset of, you know, just generations of people that are now on social media and now talking and sharing information and looking at websites and videos who don't know how to sort the crap from the real. Like, uh, whereas people who grew up, well, they already went down that YouTube rabbit hole of, you know, perpetual energy machines and like, yeah, entertaining for a little while. And they're like, okay, yeah, this is all crap. You know, like you, you literally have like a literacy. It's like taking somebody from 1920s and then showing them transformers or something. Like they would literally have a heart attack. They, they wouldn't know how to, it wouldn't know how to watch it. Like just the number of cuts, they'd have absolutely no idea what the hell was going on. Whereas somebody who grows up and like sees this transition and film slowly, well, they can make sense of it. It's, it's, it's literacy. You literally have to understand and slowly learn over time what the hell you're watching on the screen. It would be gibberish to somebody else. Um, and I think we have that same thing online. Um, and so taking a step back, even though things are so kind of shitty right now, and we have governments basically <laughs> declaring, without, the, without saying it, declaring martial law, um, and uh, uh, the, the overreaction to this is just kind of staggering and shocking how fast it happened. Um, at the same time, you know, when, when the old systems are crumbling is when shit gets bad. Like, they, when it's clear they're losing power and they're losing control is when they grab on it harder than ever. Like it's, like, it's like a relationship is falling apart and you get extra jealous and extra controlling because it's just inevitably going to fall apart. It always gets worse right at the end before you finally be like, we need a divorce. Let's end this, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that's kind of what we're going through. And we basically just have to, I think there will be a point where we live and let live. Um, and if not, if it gets so bad as to like, you know, violent fallout and a lot, well, I mean, sort of is, but you really think about it, it's kind of like a microcosm of it because we're so deeply connected to it with the internet. Like if there's any sort of violence, there's a video on it and it's shared a million freaking times. And, you know, whereas, you know, back in when millions and millions of people were dying in World War II, it was a very different game. We're just so much more connected to it that the, the volume or the, um, the degree of it seems so greater today, even though it's actually like barely a fraction. It's really not. It's, violence isn't really that bad today. It's always been horrible. It's just now we see it all the time. It's just in front of us. Um, and because of that, um, you know, like I said, I, th I think it's going to be a really painful transition. But I think the other side of this is actually, uh, there's going to be some amazing things. Like, like I think the world is changing for the better. It just hurts to change you know, um, and uh, we'll see where it goes. And like, thank God for Bitcoin and having an asset, like a, a monetary instrument that's not attached to all this shit. And you can just kind of step back and watch a jurisdiction fall apart and be like, all right, well, where the hell do I go? Like, where do yeah. I move to? Um, but at least I don't have to, at least the value in my economic security is not based on this orange idiot or this senile freaks like you know like opinions or like what decisions they make nope not my problem like i can just kind of be a 
passive observer and be like, man, the world's crazy. <laughs> Glad I got Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, you can be your own sovereign individual now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. It's a, it's an amazing, it's a phenomenal peace of mind, particularly with the transition that we're going through. Like mm -hmm. what Bitcoin me means, it lets me sleep well at night. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely say I'm in the same boat, and uh, I work in uh, behavioral health, uh, so I work with drug addicts and mm -hmm. alcoholics and have my own experience um, with addiction myself. But um, yeah, that initial coming off the drugs is really, really painful and inflation and money printing is definitely a drug. But, oh, yeah. yeah, that's a great analogy. Like, yeah. like that, that's all like really potent. Like that coming off of it is a good thing, right? Like it's mm -hmm. good that we want to break our addiction of that, but that doesn't mean that withdrawal is fun. You know, like it, it's the hard thing to do. Um, and, and I think that's kind of where we are. You know, we're, we're at the point where some of us are trying to come off of it. And this is, this is the transition. This is the withdrawal and it's going to suck. Yep. And Bitcoin sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thanks for coming on uh, guy. I know you got some work to do. Uh, uh, where, where are some good places for people to find you? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, you can hit me up on uh, Twitter. I got DMS open on both of my accounts. I've got the podcast account, which is Bitcoin audible. And then my regular account, which is at the crypto economy. Um, but you can probably find me just by searching guy swan. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, check out the, the podcast, Bitcoin audible, uh, mm -hmm. basically a daily show. And, you know, like I said, we've got, uh, shelling out. Um, we've got all of like, tons of Nick Carter's pieces, um, stuff by Jimmy Song, by Pierre Richard, by Parker Lewis's entire series. I mean, we're at 440 reads today. Um, so if there was anything you wanted to read or listen to in Bitcoin, and of course, a bunch of chat episodes, interviews, and um, uh, solo episodes as well. But uh, the, the idea was to make all of the brilliant works in Bitcoin that are written down. There's so many good ones available in audio so that you can listen to it. Cause it, ain't nobody got time to read all that shit, you know? Yeah. Except, except for me, apparently. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah check out, uh, check out Bitcoin audible, um, Twitter and Bitcoin audible.com. Uh, and yeah, that'll, that'll do it. Yeah. I'm definitely going to go listen to shelling out probably directly after this. <laughs>